Astro Pup and Lady Annabelle's Diamond Dog Collar. A little while ago, I told you how I travelled back in time with my parrot friend, the ex-president of the world, and my human comrade, Marlowe. We met Sherlock Holmes, who seemed to think the parrot was a ventriloquist's dummy, and that Marlowe had the knack of speaking with his lips closed. Holmes bet the parrot that he could not talk while Marlowe was drinking a glass of water. Need I say, the parrot won the bet hands down. Marlowe downed a whole jugful, while our feathered friend nattered on about this and that. We couldn't shut his beak up. It was Holmes who was lost for words. When Holmes conceded defeat and slung his money down on the table, the parrot squawked, Satisfaction! And Dr. Watson laughed, saying, By George, Holmes, that parrot has got the better of you. Holmes pointed his pipe at his friend and said in a most steely voice, Good doctor, be sure you never write down a word of this. Watson swore to keep mum about the whole episode. You won't find a peep about the parrot in any of his books. But nobody asked me to make any promises. People seem to forget that we dogs see a lot of things that they would like to keep quiet. Now, thanks to alien translation technology, I can reveal many secrets in English, including the mystery of Lady Annabelle's Diamond Dog Collar. Now, to continue where I left off. The parrot took advantage of the detective's temporary dumbfoundedness. He hopped over onto Holmes's desk and opened a notebook with his claw. For some time, he peered at a page with great interest. Eventually, Holmes muttered, even a bird of your talents will not understand that note. The symbols are Egyptian hieroglyphs. On the contrary, my dear Holmes, replied the parrot. Egyptology is one of my little hobbies. This note is not especially grammatical, but it would seem to mean Anubis has returned home. Good gracious! declared Holmes. I do believe that bird has eaten the Minoan black seed that, according to legend, expands the brain of any creature that ingests it. At which the parrot did a little dance, replying, Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. But so far as I know, no one has ever eaten it. I exclaimed, because I was just thinking that it was time to eat something. But the parrot ignored my wagging tail. I am curious. Tell me more, said the parrot, looking again at the neat little drawings on the notebook. I copied these symbols from a note left at the scene of a crime, said Holmes. Intriguing, commented the parrot with his head on one side. What sort of crime? A dog napping, declared Holmes. Now my interest and my left ear pricked up. But the parrot squawked in annoyance. Grrr! I thought we were dealing with a criminal mastermind. How disappointing. Nobody but a fool would waste their energy on stealing a dog. Hey, steady on. I woofed. Unless, said Holmes, the dog was so pampered that he wore a collar studded with precious diamonds. But why take the dog? asked the parrot. The stupid creature would bark and wake up the house. Why not just remove the collar? Perhaps the dog defended his collar with his teeth bared, suggested Watson. 
Perhaps he did, but presumably the thief killed the animal, said the parrot. Anubis, the Egyptian dog god, belongs in the underworld. The note says he has returned home. That means he is dead. Murder, I growled. My conclusion exactly, said Holmes, but his owner will not accept my advice. She begs me to find her pet alive and return him to her, with or without collar. In fact, she shows not the slightest concern for her lost diamonds, though their value is upwards of ten thousand pounds. Fantastic! exclaimed the parrot. A mystery! Worthy of my genius, I shall solve this case for you. I don't mind if you take the credit and the payment. All I wish for is intellectual satisfaction. I assure you, I do not need to steal credit for detective work from anyone, said Holmes. He seemed quite angry at the suggestion and was banging his pipe on the arm of his chair. Of course, conceded my feathered friend. I'd never heard him back down so graciously. It was a mark of the parrot's esteem for Sherlock Holmes. I should be most interested to hear your thoughts on the note written in ancient Egyptian. It seems an odd sort of burglar who is a scholar of antiquities. The note was an entirely appropriate touch said Holmes. My client is an expert on all things Egyptian. She has used a good portion of her wealth to acquire artifacts from the tombs of the pharaohs. Her house is a veritable museum of ancient statues, and jewels and figurines. So do you believe that a fellow Egyptologist stole the collar? No, said Holmes. I do not believe that. Which is why I have booked an interview with the Director of Egyptology at the British Museum. I wish to ask if anyone had visited him, or any of his colleagues, seeking help with writing a note in hieroglyphics. We are expected in Bloomsbury in half an hour. You may come with us, but I request you to remain quiet. A conversational bird of your intellect would create a massive amount of interest and divert us from the case. I can be quiet when it suits me, claimed the parrot. Well, that was news to me, and I could see from Marlowe's rolling eyes that he did not quite believe it was possible for the parrot to hold his beak. On the steps of the museum, a man in his peaked hat said, Sorry, sir, dogs and birds are not allowed inside. But we have an appointment with Professor Ptolemy, said Holmes, and this is a police dog. In that case, I suggest you go in by the side entrance, sir, said the man, which we did. I sniffed around the professor's room, trying to seem like I was looking for clues, which is what police dogs generally do. I found a ham sandwich and ate it. The parrot, who was sitting on Dr. Watson's shoulder, remained remarkably quiet at first. Ah, yes, Anubis has gone home. I remember the line well, said the professor. About a month ago, a gentleman asked me to write out the characters for him. And did he give you a reason for his request? asked Holmes. He said it was an inscription for a bracelet that he was giving to his sweetheart. The parrot could keep his peace no longer. How romantic! He squawked. The professor looked up and smiled. Hmm, how apt, he said. How apt! repeated the parrot, and Marlowe and Holmes both glanced anxiously at him. He had puffed out his chest as if he was about to go off on one of his long speeches, but somehow he managed to get a grip on himself and hold his exposition in. Hmm, 
Hmm, a great mimic. He should go on the stage, said the professor. Holmes nodded. A rare bird indeed. But to return to our subject, can you describe the visitor who wished to send his sweetheart a bracelet inscribed with a message in ancient Egyptian? He was smartly dressed, perhaps a little over thirty years of age, said the professor thoughtfully. He was knowledgeable about ancient Egypt. Would you say that he was a learned man, perhaps belonging to a university? Asked Watson. No, said the professor. He would have surely said so. There was something about the way he spoke. Perhaps the way he overemphasized his H's, as in history. That suggested a man of self-education. Thank you, said Holmes. That is all we need to know. The case is solved. As we stepped out into the little streets around the museum, and Holmes peered into the window of a bookshop, Marlowe said, I can't wait to hear. Who done it, Mr. Holmes? The case is disappointingly straightforward, replied the detective. It was the butler who did it. My client had in her employ a man who was her butler for five years. He is 34 years of age, and like many of his profession, his perfect elocution is a little forced. I know for a fact that he left her service under a cloud not long ago. As an intelligent person who spent time in the company of the good lady, he would be sure to pick up some knowledge of her greatest enthusiasm, the history, art and religion of ancient Egypt. One of his duties was to walk her dog, Anubis, in Hyde Park. The dog knew him and would not bark if he returned to the house and would not be the least surprised if he put him on a lead and led him away from the house. I'm a hundred percent certain that if we visit the home of this former manservant, who goes by the name of Stevens, we shall recover our diamond-studded collar. And the dog? And the dog? Asked the parrot and I both at the same time. According to the note, the dog had been dispatched to the next world. No doubt, as an act of malice against the butler's former employer. Well, said Watson, let's go and pay a visit to this Stevens. Holmes directed our cab driver to cross the River Thames and head for Old Kent Road. On the way, I imagined what this dog-murdering former butler would look like. I pictured a man with a bald head, an angry red face, and huge strangling hands. No doubt he was a cat lover! <coughs> we found his house on a street where kids were playing football in bare feet. One of them directed us to the door of the house where he lived with his brothers an old ma. Holmes rang the bell, and to my great surprise, the immediate response was loud and clear. <coughs> a face appeared at the window. It had two large pointed ears and a long thin snout. When the front door eventually opened, a dog ran out wagging his tail. He was black and slim, with slender legs. Hello, friend! I woofed. We've come to rescue you from this evil dog napper. Rescue? What makes you think I need rescuing? He asked. Aren't you Anubis the dog with the diamond collar who was stolen and presumed dead? I asked. I, I am Anubis, said he. But my master is a good fellow who takes me for plenty of walkies and shares his nosh with me. Fair's fair. Well, said I, there's been some mistake. Meanwhile, Dr. Watson was talking to Stephen's old mother. My good lady, hand over the diamond dog collar and we won't say another word. 
There ain't no dog collar here. She was saying? I should know. The house ain't big. There's nowhere to hide such a thing. This argument went on for some time. Holmes sighed and said to the parrot, Of course she would say that, wouldn't she? If I had spoken first, I would have taken a more subtle approach. But she's speaking the truth, said the parrot. The collar isn't here. Stevens didn't steal it. He left it behind on the mantelpiece of his former employer's house. He just wanted the dog. The parrot knew this because I had just told him. Anubis had given me the full story. The butler had always looked after him. The lady of the house kept Anubis because he bore a striking resemblance to the ancient Egyptian dog god. After the butler had been fired, he missed his canine friend badly. And one night he came back to the house to take him home. He left the message written to his former employer in ancient Egyptian quite appropriately and placed it with the valuable collar on the mantelpiece. Anubis gladly went with the butler because he regarded him as his true master. My dear parrot, replied Holmes, you take too kind a view of human nature. You may be sure that the butler was not so honest as to leave behind a valuable item that would make him rich beyond his wildest dreams. Kind? I'm not being kind. He left it because he's a dimwit, said the parrot. The lady of the house won't admit that she's still got the collar because she doesn't like the butler. She's angry about losing her dog. And besides, she wants to claim for the diamonds on her insurance. What makes you believe that? asked Holmes. The parrot glanced briefly at Anubis and me before saying, Intuition. The police from Scotland Yard were not far behind us. They arrived soon after and searched the house. But even their sniffer dogs could not find a trace of the diamond collar. Stevens himself turned up and was immediately handcuffed and arrested. Anubis growled at the police officers and they put a chain collar and lead around his neck. I assure you, said the parrot, that they're searching the wrong place. Perhaps the fellow has sold the collar already, suggested Watson. Perhaps, said Holmes, stroking his chin. In any case, we must return Anubis to his owner. Watson gave a sharp tug on Anubis's chain, and we clambered back aboard our handsome cab. This time, our journey took us to the high end of London society, Belgravia, where the doors of the white stucco houses are opened by butlers. A dog who lives in these expansive squares can expect to nosh on the butcher's best tripe and go for walks in Hyde Park. I knew that if Anubis was willing to give up such a life of luxury and exchange it for the rough streets of the East End, he must love Stevens the butler as his rightful owner. Lady Annabel greeted Anubis as her long lost best beloved pet stroking his handsome head and patting him affectionately. But Anubis only wagged his tail quite faintly. When Holmes explained that they had failed to recover the valuable dog collar, she waved her hand and said, What do I care for diamonds when my darling dog is returned to me? A noble sentiment indeed, I thought. If only it were true. Her diamonds were hidden somewhere in the house. Of that, Anubis had no doubt. Holmes, Watson and Marlow were invited into the drawing room to be served tea by Lady Annabel's new butler. 
We dogs were led downstairs to the pantry. The cook put water in a bowl for us and dished us up some porridge. I woofed my share down, but Anubis was not hungry. When I had finished eating both bowlfuls, I looked up and saw the parrot sitting on the head of a chair. Hey, Anubis, he said. I need to borrow your nose for some detective work. We slipped past the footman and sneaked up into the hallway. The staircase was guarded by eerie Egyptian statues that looked uncannily like cat people. I shuddered as we climbed up to the first floor and slipped into the bedrooms that were strictly off bounds to animals. Although there were plenty of statues of cats, dogs and birds. A maid came out into the landing, but fortunately she was carrying a pile of laundry that blocked her view. Lady Annabelle had not taken too much trouble to hide the diamonds. Anubis knew his own collar's smell well, and soon he sniffed it out. She had slipped it into the pocket of a silk dressing gown that was hanging in her wardrobe. He tugged at the gown with his claws and picked the collar up in his teeth. Before we could get away, the maid came into the room. Out, you naughty dog shoe! She shouted, and we flew past her. Quite literally in the case of the parrot. We headed downstairs, and when we reached the bottom step, the parrot declared, Now for the final showdown of my greatest mystery to date. We waited in the hall. Dr. Watson was just saying, We shall leave no stone unturned. When the parrot fluttered into the drawing room, Holmes looked up and said, Excuse me, Lady Annabel, my parrot has escaped. Excuse me? exclaimed the parrot. Mr. Holmes is wrong on several counts. I am not his, and I have not escaped. Good gracious, exclaimed Lady Annabel, and then she looked at Marlowe and said, was it you who said that? No, ma'am, said Marlowe. No, it was I, Horus, the bird god of the sky, announced the parrot as he settled onto Marlowe's shoulder. Then he fixed the lady with his beady eyes. She sat back in her chair, quite stiff, ashen-faced and afraid, the parrot said. I see everything. Nothing that happens in this house of Egypt escapes me. You may as well confess that you have misled Mr. Holmes and made a right Charlie of him. C -c confess what? asked the lady. That! said the parrot pointing with his wing, for while he had been speaking, Anubis had trotted into the room. He padded up to Lady Annabel with a collar in his mouth and laid it at her feet. Case solved! declared the parrot, and I woofed my approval. Why, why Anubis, you clever dog, you brought your collar back from Stephen's house, said the lady, appealing to Holmes. Why, what a clever doggy, we didn't even notice, said Watson. Holmes remained silent. Eventually, he stood up and said decisively, Watson, it is clear that we have been outbrained by a bird. I must return to Baker Street and consider my future as a detective. As we left the house, the great man looked most dejected. The parrot fluttered beside him and said, Don't take it too harshly, Mr. Holmes. In this case, we had the advantage of animal speak. Holmes tipped the brim of his deerstalker cap. I take my hat off to you, he said, and I see now that the ability to communicate with animals provides many intriguing possibilities for detective work. Animals 
see a great many things that we humans overlook. Perhaps if you have time, you will teach me some useful words and phrases. Well, certainly, said I. But Holmes didn't understand me. I am afraid, said the parrot, that we are wanted in a different time and a different place. Mr. Holmes, it has been fascinating, said Marlowe. But my friend the parrot here is right. We have another mission to complete, and we'd better be getting on with it. In that case, said Holmes, I must bid you farewell, and I thank you for an instructive lesson in the art and science of detective work.